I hate to admit it, and in fact, I'm a, a little bit reluctant to talk about it, but once my mother tried to kill me. She really did. And no, it wasn't one of those times in high school when I made some less than stellar decisions. At those tough times that she only threatened to wring my neck. But there was a time when I was five when my mom tried to kill me. Let me explain. As a growing young boy who loved to eat, I marveled at my mother's amazing biscuits. <laughs> Even Colonel Sanders would be, would be envious of these biscuits. Well, one day my mother was mixing up a new batch when Agnes Keenoff came by and distracted her from what she was doing. And I thought, hey, here's my chance to find that secret. What is that secret ingredient of hers that makes her biscuits so good? And so while she was off in another room, I looked on the shelf there, and there were all the ingredients lined up, ready to be mixed together. In the largest container, of course, contained the flour. And so I got a spoon out and stuck a spoon of flour in my mouth. And I spit and sputtered at the dryness, trying to get it out of my mouth. I even took a swig of water, but all that did is make it sticky and pasty. So I reasoned it couldn't be the flour. It must be the shortening. So I took a spoonful of shortening and, mmm, gee, I just about gagged on the greasiness and texture of that shortening in my mouth. Wasn't that either. Then there was that measuring cup there that had buttermilk in it. Ah, so I took a sip of buttermilk. Yeah, that was sour and acidic. It wasn't that either. And the only other thing left on there was one of these red cans that had baking powder on it. That had to be the ingredient. So I dug my spoon in and took some baking powder. Nah, it wasn't that either. And then it dawned on me. My mom had tricked me. She was actually trying to kill me, right? <laughs> Wrong. My mom was taking things that were strange and distasteful, mixing them together, and creating biscuits of beauty. The secret that I learned was understanding how it all works together. And that is what Job is talking about in chapter 23 today as well. Throughout the, his, most of his book, Job was thinking that God was trying to kill him, literally. In today's reading, though, we come across this verse. When he has tested me, I will come forth as gold. God is looking for a golden character, a mature Christian faith. He is looking for a life marked by depth and compassion. So God takes events that seem distasteful and strange to us and mixes them all together to create lives of beauty. The secret in this case also is understanding how it all works together. And with the case of Job, I think he has five ingredients that God has used and which God uses in various proportions in our life as well. These five ingredients, the first one is shock. When your world falls apart. I don't think any of us are fully, can fully prepare ourselves for that time when we get a phone call that says something tragic has happened to our spouse or our child. Or when you're shaving and you notice a lump in your neck. Or when you're visiting the doctor's office and he says the C word, cancer. When those things happen, it's like jumping into a bitterly cold lake. You can prepare yourself all you want and imagining how it will feel like, but when you jump in, 
the shock to your system just takes your breath away. After Job loses everything, in chapter 2, it says that he, for seven days, sits on a pile of ashes with a broken piece of pottery scraping his sores. He couldn't say anything. He was in shock. The second ingredient is sorrow, when your heart is breaking. Whatever happened to the God who is love and who has a plan for us? You see, at the beginning of chapter 23, when Job is giving voice to his sorrow, he says that he feels like it's falling on divine deaf ears. Job is looking for God to the east, to the west, to the north, to the south, the points of the horizon, the four points of the compass. And God is nowhere to be found. If Job is a true and worthy servant, then why is God evading him? Why is God ignoring him? Why is God hiding from him? Job wonders, Who started this game of hide and seek? And why am I it? By the end of chapter 23, it's clear that if Job lets us, this darkness will swallow him whole and he will drown in an ocean of God's silence. You and I can sympathize with Job about God's silence. I mean, when I pray, I expect God to answer. Isn't that what the Bible promises? Call upon me in the day of trouble. When I'm in trouble, when I need help, I assert my right as a child of God to take my complaints to God, to make my requests known, to tell my side of the story. And instead of an answer or a divine nod of assurance, I get nothing, no answer at all. I mean, I don't get an email reply. I don't get a text that says, hey, your answer is on the way. I don't get a call back on my voicemail. God is silent. Despite all my attempts to provoke an answer. Which leads to the third ingredient, struggle. When you don't understand. Job says in verse 2, even my complaint is bitter. His hand is heavy despite my groaning. Why is this happening? Why is this happening now? Why is this happening to me? Why did my husband walk out? Why did my wife die in the accident? Why did I lose my job? Why didn't I get that promotion? Why was my child born with Down syndrome? Life doesn't always make sense to us. Bad people seem to prosper. Good people seem to suffer. Why do we struggle with God? for two reasons. One, we doubt God's wisdom and therefore we want to be in control. Job says at the end of chapter 23, I am not silenced by the darkness, the thick darkness that covers my face. Life is tough. Life can beat you down and get you down, and if you let it, it can keep you down. 
But if you keep struggling, if you keep holding on like Job did, if you have resilience, then you learn from your losses. You profit from your pain. You advance through your adversity. Don't give up the struggle. Don't let the darkness silence your prayers. The next ingredient is sanctification. When God turns bad into good. Sanctification is God's process of making us more and more like Jesus. Quite often people think that God's plan for our life is to make me happy or to make me more prosperous or to make life easy for me. I hate to break this news to you, but that's not God's plan for your life. God's plan for your life is to make you more like Jesus. And sometimes that plan includes situations, events, and happenings that trouble us, that humble us, that leave no doubt that we are not in control. And yet, every problem has a purpose. We are transformed by our troubles. Other people mean it for bad, but God means it for good. I mean, anybody can bring good out of good, but God specializes in bringing good out of bad. God loves to turn crucifixions into resurrection. At the very end of Job's books, these words are included. God blessed the latter part of his life more than the first. This is the gospel goodness that turns crucifixions into resurrections, defeat into victory, death into life, that turns sinners into saints, life of sorrow into a life of eternal joy. On that Good Friday when things looked like it was at a dead end with Christ hanging on the cross suffering the sins of the world, that day was turned into a day of everlasting joy on Easter morning. A day that looked like defeat was turned into a never-ending day of victory. And that day is our day as well, as that funeral song is turned into the triumph song that we still sing today. I know that my Redeemer lives. Your nightmares are not some random happenings that have no purpose. Rather, they are wounds in that caused by that cosmic battle of good and evil. Wounds that our God is taking and weaving into a beautiful tapestry of eternal victory. That's what St. Paul says in Romans 8, 28. We know that in all things, God is working for the good of those who love Him. That verse is probably the most misunderstood, misinterpreted, and misused verses in the Bible. Note what Paul is not saying. First, Paul is not saying that all things are good because not all things are good. Trouble, loss, guilt, pain, those are all part of our lives and they cause us confusion. They mess with our minds. And secondly, Paul does not say, wouldn't it be nice if, or, well, I'm pretty sure. No. Paul is convinced. We are sure that the God of Job, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, and our God will take our strange and distasteful events of our lives and mix them all together and create a life of beauty. Which leads to the fifth ingredient, service. When we use our pain 
for God's glory. You see, God wants to take our greatest pain and turn it into our life's proclamation. He wants to use our mess for his message. He wants to use our, to turn our um, tests into a testimony. He wants to take those things that we're embarrassed by, that we're ashamed of, that we regret happens, and turn them into something good that can serve other people. Who best to help a parent of da Down syndrome child than a parents who have a Down syndrome child? Who better to help a person struggling with alcoholism than a person who has struggled with alcoholism themselves? God wants to take that thing that we want to talk least about and use it to help others. That's because God has a plan, a divine plan, a plan that is for our good and for his glory. He wants to take those things in our life that are strange and distasteful, mix them all together and create a life of beauty. The secret is understanding how it all works together. Job 23.10 When he has tested me, I will come forth as gold. And now may the peace of God which surpasses our human understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.